Have you ever put a jigsaw puzzle together when you didn't already know what the picture was going to turn out to be? So that you make a few uncertain guesses as you go along, but at some point in the assembly, you finally realize what it is that you're looking at? That's how it was for the early scientists of centuries ago to classify life forms, except it was as if they had only some of the pieces on one edge of the puzzle representing the animals that are still alive. They thought that's all there ever were. The easiest way to put together a jigsaw puzzle is to start with the edge pieces. And back then, the most puzzling thing was trying to understand why some animals were obviously grouped together and more closely associated with some groups than with others. Because before anyone proposed an evolutionary connection, it didn't make any sense why there should be associated groups at all. Independent species, sure, but not overlapping categories of species. Then they started finding other puzzle pieces in the fossil record, and these were not edge pieces because they were things that are not still alive anymore. Our quarries, our graveyards, revealing successive generations of unfamiliar monsters that lived and died in a sequence of ancient ecosystems that came long before and now lie beneath the world of men. And this gave a profound impression of depth to this puzzle. In early human history, some men considered that all life might be connected, but because they only knew about the forms that are still alive, they imagined a linear progression of fish to amphibians to reptiles and then on to warm-blooded animals. And some folks thought of this as an evolutionary ladder, but we now know that analogy doesn't work because some of these newly discovered puzzle pieces connected multiple categories of familiar fauna, illustrating a branching tree pattern of descent. At 300 years ago, we knew almost nothing about fossils at all. Since then, and especially in the last three or four decades, we found so many pieces that the image is clear. Still, there was a time when all vertebrates were thought to be divided into just five categories fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. Of these, all of them are classified as oviparous, egg layers, except for the mammals, who are the only ones that are viviparous, giving live birth. That simple rule is still a fair assessment at a beginner's level, but the more you learn about anything, the more complex the subject always turns out to be, and the more exceptions you find to the elementary rules. At this point in our series, we're moving into the Upper Jurassic period, roughly 160 million years ago. At that time, there evidently still weren't any actual birds yet, but they are the only exception to the exception that I'm about to explain. All of these animals lay eggs, including some mammals, because remember that monotremes like the platypus and echidna lay eggs, as did many different clades of early mammals, including probably all the mammals we've seen so far in this series, but that are now extinct. All of these animals give birth live, too. At least some species in each category do. We know that apart from monotremes, all other mammals alive today are viviparous, meaning their young didn't have to hatch out of an egg. Some fish give birth live too. Sharks, for example, can either be viviparous or oviparous, depending on which species we're talking about. The same goes for reptiles. Most lizards and snakes lay eggs, but some have babies literally crawling out of them. The yellow-bellied three-toed skink living along the coast of New South Wales, Australia still lays eggs, but almost all members of the same species found at the state's higher and cooler elevations give birth live. And there are a couple of other lizard species like that too. And there are similar exceptions for amphibians. The western nimba toad of New Guinea and two species of Latin American Sicilians, which are legless like the amphibian version of snakes, are all viviparous, meaning they give birth to fully metamorphosed young. So most mammals have live birth, except for very few exceptions, and most of the rest of these lay eggs, except again, there are relatively few exceptions in each case. And it's not inherited in any case. Zoologists say that different lineages of vertebrates evolved live birth independently about 150 times. So the rules are general, but not consistent, except for birds, because there's not a single species of bird that gives birth live. Amphibians typically hatch from a gelatinous egg and then go through a larval stage to metamorph into an adult. And this transition looks similar to the way birds develop in the egg or the way therian mammals develop in the womb. So it's like amphibians lost the egg early such that the fetus had to continue development on its own. Now this sequence of stages confused some early studies in embryology. For example, in the 1800s, Ernst Haeckel compared the development of tadpoles to mammalian embryos in a microscope, and he thought that humans developed from embryonic fish becoming amphibians and then reptiles before turning into mammals. There is a correlation between embryological and evolutionary development and a comparative study called EvoDevo, which will come up again in later episodes, though it's not the way Ernst Haeckel imagined it. And one of the laws of evolution is that the young of two closely related organisms will be more similar than the adults are, and this is already evident in the development of the fetus. 
A human embryo isn't much different from that of a fish or a reptile and is virtually indistinguishable from most other mammals. For example, among existing mammals today, monotremes lay eggs with very thin skins. It's not a hard shell like birds have, it's more of a membrane. And these hatch almost immediately. Compare this to the amniotic sac of other viviparous vertebrates, a weaker wet membrane that ruptures just before birth, while the monotreme membrane comes open shortly after birth. So the difference between oviparous and viviparous isn't really as much as it might seem. That's where we are in the series of evolutionary stages, where the embryo still begins as an egg, but the fetus no longer develops within an egg and is instead born out of the mother without one. That is, so far as we can tell, a unique condition among all the mammalian and pre-mammalian ancestral clades that we've seen in the series so far. The fossil record doesn't show us every detail, so it's possible, however unlikely, that some or all of the Zatharian or Tribosphenidin subsets could have born live young instead of laying eggs, but we know that is the case with Tharians because we still have those today and every one of them is viviparous. Remember that except for the platypus and the echidna, every mammal that still exists today belongs to this one group, while every one of these peripheral species groups are all extinct. And there are several ways organisms can reproduce maybe an unnecessarily complex metamorphic sequence with multiple egg stages. Maybe that ends with exploding out of the chest of a host organism. Fortunately, we don't see a lot of that on this planet. But among mammals, there are only two options. So, assuming you accept that you are a mammal at all, then what kind of mammal are you? At this point in our series, that is determined by whether you develop from embryo in a womb. Live birth makes you Therian, even if Caesarean. Otherwise, if you came out of your mother while still in an egg and later hatched, then you're something else.